If there are any questions, just give me a sign and I will come to you. Winfried, hattest du eine Frage? Oder? Okay. Uh, what I, I might have a question. There's, there's a question up there. Isn't it? No, no, no. Uh, well, yes. Uh, I found your argument about the mirrors quite convincing. Um, but uh, I was just thinking, uh, compared to the other Warhol films, This, this film really had some sort of a sense of a closure, narrative closure with uh, the, um, the reel of, of AD tech to the end. And, and I found this some, somewhat unusual. And I was also thinking about what, what you said uh, about the mirrors, uh, the self in the mirror and the performative self and the self as performance for the mirror. And then... Uh, Then I was thinking about, on the one hand, you have this sense of openness where Edie is just being herself, doing what she normally does. Uh, well, not eating so much, but taking all the other stuff and so on. And pills and, and, and alcohol. Pills and alcohol. And so, so on the one hand, this openness. On the other hand, you have the, 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 the narrative... Uh, that is um, clear from the beginning. So you have this, this sort of narrative arc where, where it's quite clear how it, how it will end. And in a sense, this, this would mark some sort of closed circuit. And on the other hand, you have this, this openness. And the closed circuit is, again, part of what, what I thought you, we were arguing for with the mirrors, the self performing for itself but but uh, it's some sort of a feedback uh, into uh, wh where there is no uh, you don't have a sense of a self that is like an autonomous self but just some some effect of performance that that is uh, fed back into some sort of circuit and then yeah I, I, w I was wondering if you could comment on that um, well, f f first I think that w one of the reasons this film is so interesting is precisely because of all those tensions that you enumerate. Um, it's neither a uninflected narrative, uh, non-narrative, nor is it a really um, persuasive narrative story. It, it, it seems to be between those things all the way through. Uh, but I think your remark about feedback is really very summary. Um, if you compare this to uh, inner and outer space where Edie yeah. has the direct feedback, right. it's, it's just the exact right word. And for me what's interesting, or one of the things that's interesting, is the difference between the first reel when she has that direct feedback and she has the corroboration of herself through the guy who's cutting her hair when she seems to be able to exist relatively stably and relatively comfortably in that environment. Do you want to translate that yeah. bit? Do you want to translate that bit? No, I think all the people here uh, okay. know. In and the second reel, where she doesn't have anything to corroborate her identity. There's that mirror on the wall, but she doesn't use it hardly at all. And there's nobody else in the environment. And so she seems to dissolve... Uh, uh, she, to lose herself, either to lose herself or to lose herself in the role of Lupe. And so all the way through that, uh, uh, the, the second long reel, I'm asking myself, is she really drunk and stoned or is she acting drunk and stoned? And it seems pretty clear that uh, she is really drunk and stoned, that she's dissolving, she's losing herself and dissolving into the same situation that Lupi Velez herself dissolved into. So, but, but your, your word feedback, I think, summarizes the role played by mirrors Uh, either literal mirrors or by people who corroborate her identity, reflect back her identity. Yes, please. But, 
uh, in your lecture, uh, you gave a kind of spoiler alert, right. um, uh, stating implicitly that uh, this film differs um, uh, decisively from other uh, war narratives. Um, um, and uh, it would be interesting whether you could specify now uh, that we have seen the film, in which way. For example, um, uh, in not not merely in a tech I mean not merely in a technical way that uh, each uh, role uh, has uh, an added uh, um, the first reel has an added uh, uh, edited uh, a bit uh, to it and the second one several shots uh, edited to it but in a, in terms of plot construction uh, how does it differ for for example from uh, the narratives written by Ronald Tavell? Well, you probably know more than I do because you've seen a number of these films much more recently than I have. But what I noticed was that in many Warhol's films, there's a situation set up um, and the actors proceed fairly stably through that and then suddenly the film ends. Um, it doesn't seem to have the same kind of narrative arc with which we're familiar. But in this film, Warhol very decisively adds a narrative arc to it by editing, first of all, by editing a scene on the end, and secondly, by editing a scene which differs so radically from the scenes that have come before. Is that not true? But if you have counterexamples, I'd be very glad to hear it so that I can correct my generalization. The film to be shown in two weeks from now, uh, My Hustler, the second reel differs very, very much from the first reel, uh, for example. Uh, that is true, that is true, but each reel doesn't, uh, and so there's a difference between the first reel and the second reel, but each reel itself doesn't have much of a narrative structure to it. So those in the second reel, the people in the toilet uh, combing their hair, could go on two hours, three hours, four hours, without anything di uh, different happening. And in the first reel, the people watching uh, Paul America on the beach, they don't seem to do anything specifically with him, that that section could be elaborated more or less indefinitely. But of course you're right, there is a difference between the two reels. I think um, Mark wants to yeah, say. Yeah, maybe it's somewhat picking up on that question and thinking about the issue of narrative, um, because my hustler, of course, also interestingly ends with a, a kind of abrupt um, insertion of a sort of commentary scene. Um, it's the second. We'll see it in a couple of weeks, but yeah. the second reel where it, the second reel is entirely these two guys talking in the bathroom and flirting with each other, and then. Um, there's a kind of abrupt break and you have then these three other people come on and comment to them, although that's all in one shot. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm just thinking of now after having seen Chelsea Girls um, last week um, um, and thinking in the double screen projection and knowing that Lupe was also premiered in, uh, I guess, a triple screen, that, that just it's just a thought, it's not really a question, but I'm just thinking of ne of how the, th watching this, the I didn't initially think so much of narrative um, in terms of the insertion of the, the, the death moment, um, but, but as a, almost a kind of commentary function, it was the double screen effect, but in a kind of linear, on one screen. In the sense that that to me, I, it it just was in a I, it just made me think of wonder about narrative in relation to Warhol's double screen experiments, but then also thinking that even here in Lupe, um, he seems to be inserting this shot that doesn't so much bring any narrative to conclusion, but instead punctuate it with a kind of commentary punctuate that which we have seen with a commentary. For those who, if you don't know the Kenneth Anger story, um, and you just get the title of the film, one one has no, no reason to actually, I mean, there's nothing about Lupe Velez in that. Edie Sedgwick is so far 
distant from it. So, so in a sense, it, it has a kind of slice of life and then suddenly a commentary on that slice of life. I, I don't know if that's relevant. Well, I, I think you're right. It is a commentary on it, but I could not make the same dissociation from narrative that it would allow you to um, um, limitingly refer to it as a commentary. It does really conclude her life, um, and it occurs after the events of the second e of the second part of the after the events of the evening. So, from my point of view, the narrative connection is still very, very strong, and in fact determinate given her death. What I think is interesting in respect to the one and two real version is that if you see it in a two real version, the death happens on each real simultaneously. But when you see it as we saw it tonight, the death has already happened before the evening sequence. And I wonder, just as a matter of, uh, of general interest, how many of you felt sure that the death, after you'd seen the death once, how many of you felt sure that the death was going to return again at the end of the second reel? Or did it come as a surprise? Anybody? It wasn't a surprise. You expected that death would, you know. And so in a way, um, what's really interesting is that once you've seen the death at the end of the first reel, that death hangs over the whole of the second reel. You know that this is going to culminate in her death. And as she gets drunker and drunker and more stoned, then you kind of realize that that death is imminent. But I think it is very interesting, the temporal and spatial differences between the one-screen one version and the two-screen version. Can you please tell us something more about why you decided to, to uh, let us screen it that way and not as a double screen? Um, I can't remember why we decided that, did we, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think I made the decision that, it was that we, we would like to have screened it both ways. But I made the decision that the amount of information in each reel was so much that I wanted us to get a chance to assimilate all the information rather than lose part of it in the two screen version. It, it also what's different in the, in the two screen version is the sound because um, the moments when there are, when there is sound tend to um, alternate with each other. So you don't get these prolonged periods when there, are n when there is no sound. Uh, you always get s you get more sound in the two screen version than you do in the one we saw. I, I was, I was yes. <clears throat> Could you comment on the two death scenes? Because um, perhaps I was wrong, but I had the impression that the um, even if it was a, this kind of this double projection, that it was actually uh, filmed in a quite different way. So I had the impression that the first death was more of a kind of a private death, so with longer takes and uh, almost a sculptural uh, way of filming it, and the second one was more, uh, almost more public with more editing and uh, with uh, different camera angles and uh, uh, is this true or was this... Um, no, no, you're exactly correct. The first death scene is shot in one take with a stationary camera. But the second death scene is shot with one camera and there's no editing outside of the camera, but the editing takes place in the camera and the camera moves and occupies a different position. And in fact, in one of the takes, you actually the camera actually moves within the take. Um, I myself could not uh, suggest a, an explanation or an interpretation of this, except to say that something like, well, Warhol did it one way for one version of it and did it another way for the other version. That about what you, from, from what you said, the thing that I don't 
understand is the fact that one is more public and one is more personal. I think your remark about the sculptural quality of the first version is, is very um, acute, and I thank you for that. But I don't understand why you say one is public and one is more personal. All oh, right. So it's so it's the it's the personality of the uh, of the cameraman revealing himself by changing a focus of his interest and things of that kind. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I was wondering if you could uh, say a little bit more about the color of this film because I saw, I thought about what would happen when you have the double projection, uh, and the red. Uh, negligee and the uh, blue dress and and so on and and also uh, the dress seemed to be quite out of place the dress in the second reel Eddie's uh, dress out of place in a Warhol film or unusual because it's not glamorous uh, it looked it would have I thought about Jane Austen or something like that but not Warhol <laughs> Okay, let's take those one at a time. Yeah. Um, I think you're exactly right about the color, um, that Warhol seems to have uh, orchestrated the color and the color combinations um, quite uh, with degree of intentionality. Uh, the first reel, uh, she is in uh, pink and red, um, and the guy cutting her hair, Billy Name, has the blue shirt on behind, and then in the second reel, it switched around the... Uh, the dress that she's wearing is blue, right? right? Yeah, and there's a certain amount of red in the environment around. Uh, and so um, it seems that that color was done very, very deliberately. And the, oh, the other part of your question about the dress, I don't know, um, the, 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 obviously in the first screen when she's wearing that very uh, slight negligee, there's a certain amount of sexual titillation. Are we going to see her breast or something like that? Um, and I'm sure Warhol is exploiting that. But in the second reel, when she's wearing uh, uh, this dress, and I, my knowledge of women's clothes is not sufficient for me to say what that is. Is it a, is it a formal going to bed negligee? Um, perhaps somebody in the audience could enlighten us about what is implied or what, uh, what kind of a dress that is that she's wearing. But is, is it an empire line? Um, it, it just, I thought it might have, it didn't look like a 30s Hollywood style dress or a nightgown to me. I don't know about that, but it, it looked I, out of place, I don't know. So could somebody tell us? This uh, young woman. Oh. Actually, she was wearing in both of the wheels a baby doll dress, which is normally hiding the stomach. Right. So it, it shapes the body better. But my interpretation was that maybe in the first reel, she was more trying to be the female person, also because of the color. And in the second, but that was just my interpretation, she was wearing like or showing up her male side and hiding her female, maybe, I don't know, um, shape. In, yeah. in England, they say pink for girls and blue for boys. And so that would coincide with yeah. you, exactly. That's really like superficial. Yeah. But, but, what, but what about the dress itself? Was it a, an attractive going to bed item of clothing for a woman or? Yeah, could she have worn that? Ah, okay. <laughs> could she have worn that to bed, or would she have taken that off and put a different kind of dress on to go to actually lie down in bed? Uh, I think maybe the bed is her house as well. Maybe there is no difference between the pajama and what you're wearing in the house. Yeah. That it's just like her fulfillment and what she is. Okay, so this is her last evening. She's yeah. eating her supper, then she's going to go to bed. Yeah. Is she going to wear that dress into bed, or is that something she's just wearing for the dinner, and then she'll wear something different into the bed? 
I think it's the same, but so it's a night dress of one yeah, kind or yeah. another. That's what I assumed, but uh, it's not an area where I'm particularly well well informed. Um, I, I I don't know exactly as well, as well, but I'm not sure if this is really a night dress because um, I have had the impression that um, uh, in in painting you find this dress is, uh, I think, in the 18th century or something. And uh, then you have the reference to the antique um, in this dress. And uh, in the first reel, you see in the image, uh, this antique scene in the background, there's a, a, paint, um, a painting, a little one, with a male lying on a bed and a female giving him something. I didn't... But maybe somebody can ident identify but this I, picture. I really in the didn't first want to give that much theme. importance to the dress with my question. I was just no, wondering but, why. But why <laughs> I think this uh, is important. Why it looked <laughs> out of place. <laughs> no, but I think this is important because it's not a fashionable dress. It's mm -hmm. some kind of dress um, which spans over the time, uh -huh. and then it has something to do with maybe eternity or something. Um, I, I don't know, but tell us more about this painting that I I've missed it entirely. Really? Yes. Um, it's in the first in the reel. First reel there is some sort of green, yeah. uh, a round shaped. Um, oh, of course. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. And yes. there's antique yes. scenery on it. Yes. And the woman is wearing a dress which looks like simil very similar to the dress in the second Fabulous. <laughs> I'm going to have yeah. to look for that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I'm, I'm going to definitely bear that in mind and see if I can make a link between that and the second dress. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. So are there any other questions? Well, well, let me end by um, th thanking you very, very much for coming. Um, I hope you enjoyed the film, uh, but uh, especially thank you very much for your uh, um, kind questions and hospitality. It's been a great honor and a privilege for me. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, thank you. David James. <laughs>